All right, John chapter 19, we, we, we jump into the trial of Christ. He's, he's been put on trial by the Jews. They found him guilty of blasphemy. They've taken him over to Pilate now. They're trying to pressure Pilate to condemn him. Pilate, though, keeps coming back to them with, I find no fault in this man. He, he's an innocent man. So Pilate's trying to steer them a different direction, to get them to do something else. And as we read down through this, we want to remind ourselves that this is the most monumental event in all of human history that's taking place here. When we think about the sacrifice of the Son of God and um, everything from essentially the garden when Adam and Eve partook of that fruit to this point, has unfolded for this very purpose. God guided history, people, nations, um, to bring this very event about so that His Son could be offered as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And as we think about what's happening here, this is what gives us eternal hope. This is what allows us to look forward to a home in heaven because of the blood that was shed so that our sins can be forgiven and we can have fellowship with God in this life and then of course in the next life. So let's read John 19, um, let's read the first 16 verses, let's break that up just a little bit though. Uh, let's go, let's say 1 through 9 and then 10 through 16. Who will grab John 19, 1 through 9 for us, Elijah? So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted the crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to him, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in you. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find him fault. And Jesus answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, the Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And when he came into the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answers. And 10 through 16, who will grab that? Charles, you want to get 10 through 16? You want to read 10 through 16 for us? The pilot said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you? and power to release you. Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not sinners or spirits. Your relation said the king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard of it, saying, He brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat, in a place that is called Haiti, but in Hebrew, the back. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover at about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, that We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. All right, so backing up to the beginning of the chapter, it says, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Does anybody remember uh, what's involved in the scourging? Like a cat and nine tails, like I'm saying, uh, and they generally have sharks or something. 
eat them pretty much until the skin comes off. Right, right. They would, they would take them, put them over a stone, around a post of some kind, uh, tie their hands up generally on the other side, and strip their back bare, then have that whip that has the strands on the end of it with some type of sharp objects, rocks, metal, bone, or something, and they lash them. And what it would do, of course, is sometimes uh, it would cut the back. Sometimes those sharp points would stick in the back, and then they'd jerk it back out. So you can imagine how that would do. Uh, but this was so brutal that the seven in ten people died just from the scourging. The blood loss, sometimes organs would be exposed because that skin would be ripped and slashed and you know it would just open up. Uh, so that's what he was going through and it seems that what Pilate is doing in this is that it's not an uncommon thing but what he does in following this is he's probably trying to satisfy the Jews in punishing Jesus this way. Because he keeps coming back and saying, I find no fault, I find no fault. And so it's almost like he's looking for a little bit of a middle ground here. Now, remember, uh, it was around this time after they had scourged him that they put the crown of thorns on his head, they put the purple robe on him, they begin to mock him and make fun of him um, and, you know, begin to worship him in a, in a uh, ridiculing manner. And then Pilate there in verse 4 says, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Sometimes they would scourge and they thought, well, torture is the only way to get truth out of people. And so he says, look, I've done this and there's nothing he's done that's worthy of death. Yeah, yeah, that really comes out down in here a little bit later in the account of how these men, yes, it's purely pure hypocrisy on their part. Um, it's, it's a great example of the degree to which hatred and envy can drive a person. It can just completely blind them to anything that is good and right. Now, uh, the following verses that we read, verses 5 through 16, you know, Pilate ends up caving to the pressure that the Jews are putting on him. They, he presents Jesus bloodied, behold the man, in verse 5. And then, of course, how do they respond to that? When he comes out, there's blood on Jesus, there's blood on his back. You, you can imagine it dripping uh, down from him off of his head. How do the... How do the Jews, chief priest, react? Crucify him. Crucify him. And you can imagine how energetic they are in that. How angry. Yes. Yes, a chant. Um, that would not have been unlike what happens in Ephesus many years later with greatest Diana of the Ephesians. Just a just a madness uh, that takes over the mob. Um, now, how does Pilate then respond to that? They say, crucify him, crucify him. You take him. You know, in, in my mind, this is Pilate being sarcastic. You take him and do it. You want him dead so bad, you take him and crucify him. I'm not going to do that because he's innocent. And so the Jews then reveal their true motivation here, or at least they, they really say, this is why we hate this guy. And in verse 7, what is it they come out with? Yeah. Yeah. Our law says he ought to die because he said he's the son of God. So, 
if you remember back in his trial before the Jews, that's, that's what they really came down on. And asking him, are you the son of God? He said, yes, you, you rightly said. And you'll see me sitting at the right hand of the power. And so now they're saying, here's why we believe he ought to die. And so you need... Remember, they started out when they took him to Pilate. Um, Pilate, he needs to die. Why? He's an evil person. <laughs> you know, they just kind of take our word for it. And they, they keep piling these things on to put pressure on Pilate. And when Pilate hears that he has claimed to be the Son of God, he reacts with fear. Why would he react with fear at this point? They probably have to be very careful with some cultural tradition of the people they talk to. And, um, you know, I think Pilate saw him in the Holy Man and sort of religious thing. I mean, he was harmless. Okay, so if you back up in the trial before Pilate, Pilate basically didn't know who he was before he showed up. As he says, are you a king? And the Lord asked him, is this something you perceived or is it something somebody told you? Like you say, Pilate didn't see him as a threat at all. He's, he hadn't come up on Pilate's radar as some type of political rebel. Otherwise, Pilate would have been all over this. But he, he's there before the... The, uh, or the Lord is there before Pilate and when, he's, when they tell him you know, he made himself to be the son of God Pilate all of a sudden changes his attitude a little bit probably because the pagans believed that gods came down and walked among men and they had all those myths and so he's all of a sudden wait a second you're saying he's, he's some type of divine being it's that paganism coming out in him um and we'll get to that culture issue in just a minute because there, that plays into the background. That's actually in the history here of why Pilate probably gives in here in a little bit. But, so he goes in and he asks Jesus, you know, verse 9, where are you from? All of a sudden he's very curious. Exactly who are you? Well, what's going on here? And Jesus didn't answer him, but... Then it says that Pilate marvels. Why does he marvel? Why is he surprised at this, if you will? Verse 10. Okay. Okay, that's what's in Pilate's mind, Clint. He's not putting up resistance. Yeah. And um, Pilate here is wholly self-deceived. He thinks he's in control. Okay, so politically, officially, on paper, Pilate's the governor, right? He is. And yes, in theory, he has the power of life and death in saying execute him or release him. In theory, he has that. But as we read down through here, and then, of course, when the Lord responds to him, but as you read down through here, Pilate's not in control of this situation. If he was in control, Jesus would have walked. The Jews are in control. They're the ones driving this agenda here. And Pilate is, is trying to get a hold of it, but he can't. So he's... He is marveling at, why, why don't you deal with me? I, you know, I'm trying to help you out here. Why don't you work with me on this? You know, I have, I have the power. And what does the Lord tell him in 11? Oh, 
And it's the only power you've got. You're, you're, you're not who, what you think you are. And this isn't happening under your control. You, you really don't have it. Because this was going to happen. Right? This, this is why the Lord came. It just so happened to Pilate's the guy there at the time. But, you have no power at all unless it's been given to you from above. God is the one who raises men up, who brings them down, raises up rulers, brings them down. You're in this position because God wants you in this position. But he says, therefore the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Who delivered Pilate, or delivered Jesus to Pilate? The high priest, Caiaphas, right? He's the guy who took him over there. He was the guy who was officially recognized as high priest by the Romans. And so he's saying he has a greater sin. Why would he have the greater sin? Exactly. He, he should have been the one recognizing that. But he didn't. And he's, he's the one seeing to the execution of the Son of God. Chris. I think it almost sounds like at this point that Pilate, being uh, in his position, holding the power that he had, was almost dumbfounded by the reaction that he got from Jesus when he never found him. Mm -hmm. He stood his ground. Mm -hmm. He never showed violence. Mm -hmm. And he would think that you know, if everything was going on, somebody would be begging for a line. But no, Jesus was giving him straight answers the whole time. Here it is. What do you think? Just curious. What do you think that Jesus, I mean, not going to happen anymore? Uh, because Herod was a filthy, low down, dirty, rotten scoundrel. That's why he didn't answer Herod. Because <laughs> Herod, Herod was responsible for killing his cousin, the greatest man born among women, John. He beheaded him because John exposed his adultery and said, you know, you're in adultery. It's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. I, I believe that's why and the Herod family goes way back trying to kill, you know, his grandfather tried to kill him when he was a baby. <laughs> you got all those things going on. So. I, I think he did too. Pilate is working very hard here because, as we said before, in the history of dealing with the Jewish people, he had gotten into serious trouble before in killing people that shouldn't have been killed. The Jews got upset about that. They complained to Rome. Rome came down hard on him. And so he, he's walking a really fine line right here. And he's, he's trying not to kill an innocent man, but that pressure is just not letting up as, as they are there before him. So, verse 12 says, from then on, Pilate sought to release him. No, by the way, in verse 11, he's not saying Pilate's innocent. <laughs> he's, just, he's just pointing out, look, those other guys, they have more knowledge. They should have known better. They, they've got greater guilt in this than you do. But they're both committing sin. Let's be clear about that. But 12, he says, you know, he, he sought to release him. So he's still on the side of G Jesus is innocent even after that exchange. And they bring up this issue here of if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Does anybody remember the history on that issue, that particular point? There's, there was an official designation of someone being a friend of Caesar. And that was saying that they basically had Caesar's approval and favor and things like that. And if that was revoked, essentially that person lost all position of power and usually exiled and all their property confiscated. So they're making a serious threat to Pilate here and saying, look, you let him go, we're going to Caesar. We're going around you. We're going over your head. We're going to tell him that you are supporting somebody who is a rival. And so they're, they're threatening Pilate, essentially losing his governorship, potential exile, loss of all his property. His life would be ruined and over. And they were serious because they had been to the, um, 
to the Caesar before in complaining to Pilate. So when they do this, verse 13, what does Pilate then do? What's his next step? He's, yeah, he's going to the cross, all right? Now, when he says, Behold your king, away with him, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Verse 15, how do they respond to that? And this is what Joe was talking about a while ago. Yeah. Like the Romans, and they like Caesar ruling over them, and you know they're sucking up to that side. Mm -hmm. Instead, you know, it's just another. Tour. What was their true view of Caesar? Hate his guts. We they they would love nothing more than to have a Jewish king come in and throw off that Roman power, and then go back to the good old days, Clint. Mm -hmm. Part of the group that literally tried to undermine it in some way with supply lines or assassinations or anything to cause them havoc. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have that extremist situation, but none of the Jews ever liked the Roman Empire. Right. Yeah, there, there was an element of Jews among them, the Herodians, who were kind of aligned for power and money purposes with the ruling government. But the majority, overwhelming majority of Jews could not stand Rome, didn't want Rome there. Uh, they were offended at these pagans being there and ruling over them, things like that. So this is pure hypocrisy here. Now, I want to make note in verse 14, if you read this, and you see it was the preparation day of the Passover. Well, wait a second. When we study in Matthew, Mark, Luke... Jesus observed the Passover the night before. But here it says preparation day. There's a couple of different explanations. One of them is that there was a calculation of time and the observance of the Passover that the Pharisees adhered to and one that the priests, the Sadducees, adhered to. And so there was actually a, a Passover on Thursday and a Passover on Friday. And they just sort of, both of them live with that. Okay, that's one explanation. That's, that's the best thing that I could see that is going on here in the differences in the two accounts. But whatever it is, uh, this is a day when the Jews are concerned about what's happening the next day as we're going to read in the latter part of the chapter. Uh, remember the Jewish leaders were concerned about being defiled going into the praetorium because then they wouldn't be able to eat the Passover so that's the chief priest again things like that um, but anyways the Matthew Mark Luke make it clear Jesus observed it the night before so we know one thing for sure that was the Passover Jesus would not have violated the law okay but be that as it may all right high priest and the hierarchy of the then Jewish camel were not practicing what they should have practiced. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Now, let's read uh, 17 through 30, please. Again, we'll break this up. How about 17 to 24, then 25 to 30? Who will grab 17 to 24 for us? Go ahead, Jesse. And he buried his cross from the fourth into a place called over the place of the school, which is called in Hebrew Gabbatha. Where they crucified him and two other and two others with him on either side. And Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and writing and the writing said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read by many of the Jews. Twenty-four, please. 
he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, and every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, Therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but pass lots for it, as it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled or said. They fired my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. And 25 to 30, who will grab that for us? Now there stood by the cross of Jesus' his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. All right. So they take him out. We won't go through all the details. Uh, of crucifixion, what's involved in that, just I'm sure you've studied it before, it's horrific, uh, designed to extend the suffering and prolong the time until they die. So they do that with the Lord and then Pilate puts this sign up over him. What is the purpose of this sign? Does anybody know that? Is it all the, the three main things? Well, there is that, but this, first of all, the sign itself, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, why would that be posted up there? And what sign would the other two guys have, Clint? It was a common practice to identify what they had done. And so, Pilate, Pilate wanted to know what they had done. Genuinely enough, what's up there is the truthful. Okay. Rick? Yeah, here, here's what they were convicted on. This is, this is why they're here and what it was designed to do. So, so the other guy, right, on the one side would have thief above him. So what it would do is people go by, they would say, I don't want to be a thief. I don't want to claim to be the king of the Jews. It was a, a way to dissuade people. So he puts up Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. The whiny chief priests come along. Well, oh, don't put that, don't put that. Uh, put up that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate finally is just like, no. What I've written, I've written. They, <laughs> they don't want up there the very thing they went to Pilate <laughs> and said, this is the problem. They now want to kind of change it, and Pilate's not letting that happen. Now, it was written in these three languages, and Chris, did you have more? Why would it be written in three languages? This way it covered all the different people that were in the area. Greek, Hebrew, Latin. What was Greek? Common language, like English today. English is kind of the worldwide universal language. Uh, so Hebrew it's right there it's the local language in Latin Rome the official language right that's why it would be in the three different languages there so um, all the I's are dotted the T's are crossed so to speak so then the soldiers who crucified him they took his garments and what do they do with it and what's why is this even mentioned okay it was prophetic, but this was a common thing that the Roman soldiers would do. They would take the condemned's clothing, possessions, whatever value they could get. That was kind of their bonus. It's kind of morbid, but that was kind of a perk of the job. It also the Right, it did. It tells us that a thousand years before the Lord knew exactly how he would die. That he would die at the hands, not of the Jews, 
but of another power that's, of course, it talks about it in, in Daniel, foretelling of the coming of the Roman Empire, but doesn't name it. But anyways, it's, it's saying God knew all along exactly what would happen. Even these little details of things that come up, including what Jesus says from the cross here in just a moment that we'll look at. Well, that prophecy is fulfilled to dividing the garments among those soldiers, his worldly possessions. Um, that's what the Lord had. They took it, divided it up, because in their mind he doesn't need it any longer. And then what happens with his mother? What's the scene being given to us there? Right. And imagine the suffering he's going through and his mother walks up to him. She's there. I mean, he's talking to her, to John, who are standing there in front of him. It, it's a touching scene as he's there. As a, as a son, he was God and man. And this is the son of Mary who's speaking and, and saying, look out for her and putting her in John's care. Now, if you trace out through the New Testament, John was his cousin. James and John were the cousins of Jesus. And he's, he's saying, you, you need to take care of my mom. Now, it's interesting that his brothers aren't there. And why might that be? But, They're, yeah, the, the Gospels indicate they're skeptics. They, they're really not convinced that he is who he says he is. Now later, they come around because his brother James is one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. Right? Jude, Judas, wrote a book, the book of Jude. So, evidently, he doesn't have confidence in them at this point. He has full confidence in John. And John and his family evidently have some money. They have some wealth. Because remember, talked about when Jesus went on trial, he knew the high priest. And that wasn't just anybody whose family would know the high priest. They had a fishing business, right? They had servants working in that business. Sometimes we get the picture of the apostles that they're just dirt poor, all of them. That, that wasn't the case. Matthew, being a tax collector, would have been a quite wealthy man. So, he's turning to John and saying, look out after her. And John, it says, takes on this responsibility to take care of Mary. Now, verses 28 to 30, what do we have here? I'm sorry we have to go fast, but I do want to get through 19, so Mike can pick up in 20, but... So 28 to 30, what's happening? Okay, yeah, he's dying. And it says that the scripture might be fulfilled. What He says, I thirst. What, what's that pointing to? Anything in particular, maybe why John the Apostle notes this and the other ones... Maybe don't, but he specifically highlights it. Son of death. Do what? Son of death. Son of death. Death is close. Well, I was just thinking it reiterates the point that he's this is a human and the prophet's prophet. He's still physical flesh. Exactly. Because remember, John, first, second, third John, he's hitting against the Gnostics who said that there's no way. The Son of God came in the flesh because flesh is evil. So he just, he just appeared here like a hologram or something. And John's just very specifically pointing out, no, nope, there was a body. He was thirsty. He was physically suffering. And it fulfilled Scripture. And again, that very minute detail about Scripture, knowing exactly what would unfold on the cross. So that gives us more confidence 
that he is the son of God. Now, it says that they gave him the sour wine. This would, this would be the common working man's drink in the field. The workers would have this type of thing. It, it was a thirst quencher. It was sort of their energy drink, if you will. It's, this is not saying he had alcohol. Remember, wine in the Bible is used just generically as juice and the, um, the context tells you whether or not it's alcoholic. He refused narcotics before when they went to crucify him. This is specifically to relieve thirst. And so it says, when he had received this, the Lord spoke and said, it is finished. Any thoughts about his words on it is finished? His purpose for being there is completed what God made it Exactly. Clint. Right. And let's understand he's not uttering it is finished in the sense that I am defeated, it's over, you know, a depressed state. He's saying it is finished. I've done exactly what I intended to do. This is this is a statement of really accomplishment, not failure. It's finished. And so he's here at this point that he's going to give his life. Was there another thought? Uh, John 17, says that to the Father, I have changed the work that you have given me. Yes, exactly. Now, it's interesting how it's worded here. Uh, the New King James, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Is there another wording in another translation? ESV or NASB, anybody have that? Gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. Anything interesting about that? Right. 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 Abel had his life taken from him. Jesus gave it. Right. He gave it. This was a voluntary death. Because if he had wanted to hold on to life as the Son of God, as the creator of the universe, the creator of life, he could have held on to life. It wouldn't have matter what they did to him. But he gave his life there and accomplished all that God had given him to do. All right, so <clears throat> let's read 31 to 42. And I'll just read that for sake of time. And then we'll dig into it a little bit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the customs of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So Jesus, having given up his life, 
the body is there on the cross and the Jews want all the bodies to be taken away, it says because it's the Sabbath day. And that's simply the idea of that evening at sundown began Saturday, the seventh day, but it also began the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would have been a holy day of convocation or essentially a Sabbath. So there's a Sabbath on top of the Sabbath. It was an extra holy day for them. And so they won it down and that was according to the law because if they left the bodies, it would defile the land. But they won it down. So the soldiers go out there and this is all providential that the soldiers go out to see what's going on. Is he dead? Is he not dead? They break the legs of the first and the second, so they suffocate to death. They come to Jesus, and what do they realize? He's already dead. How would they know that? Yeah. Yeah. They use spear going to the side, the water gushed out. Okay, water and blood, which indicates what? The body is dead. The heart is stopped. And it stopped long enough for that blood to start to separate those elements in it. Clint? The people, the Roman soldiers who are put on this little guard to do these executions, it's, this is not their first rodeo. They've been putting people to death often. I mean, this is something that they were trained to do. And so when they look up on and they see this, they were trained in this manner as people, and so in a sense, it's well. Let's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I could call on Hank, but um, soldiers, as these guys were, these guys were used to the battlefield. They knew what death looked like. They they had been around it a lot. And if you're out on a battlefield, you come across where people are dead. And that would have been a, a detail for the Roman soldiers, kind of like Clinton. Yeah. Uh, you'll have burial units. You'll have that was their execution. That's what right. they were trained to do on a daily basis. That's, mm -hmm. They were hired to do that job. Right. They, they as part of a legion, you know, when the fighting came. Everybody from the cook and everybody else, they're out there, right? They're, they're out there getting at it on the battlefield. And these guys, their, their day to day thing in Jerusalem included these crucifixions when the time came. And so, yes, they knew what death looked like. Because it says they came up on him, he's dead already. All right, we need to verify this because their job and literally their life was on the line. So they poke him with the spear. And that blood and water comes out. It verifies it. He didn't just pass out. It wasn't just a loss of blood. It was, he's dead. And they knew it. And John then makes note of, I was there and I saw it. So there's verification of somebody who knew Jesus intimately who saw it. And the other accounts also talk about all the women who were there and witnessing what was going on. And they saw when he was taken off the cross, they saw where they took his body. So that's why they knew Sunday morning where they were going to go to further prepare the body for burial. So you have these eyewitnesses that Jesus indeed died on the cross there before the Romans. Any other thoughts? before we grab this last part here. All right. Who's involved in his burial, putting him in the tomb at this point? Okay, Joseph and Nicodemus. Who are these two men? They are good men. Yes. Both of them were on the Sanhedrin council. Both of them were council members. So that council 
that tried Jesus in the kangaroo court, so to speak, and took him over then to Pilate, not everybody necessarily was in agreement on what had happened. But when you have 70 men, and you have these two who specifically, it talks about, you know, disciple of Jesus secretly for fear of the Jews, he was evidently intimidated, didn't want to speak up, didn't defend him at the trial. But you know, that's not really different than Peter, is it? Peter didn't want to really get mixed up in it, denied that he even knew the Lord, repeatedly. So, at this point though, when Joseph and Nicodemus go to Pilate and say, we want the body, what are they doing? Why are they taking a big risk? They are declaring openly to everyone, we believe in Him. Because people did not want to be associated with the condemned. Right? Usually, people who were put on that cross, either their bodies were taken and thrown into the city dump, you know, the valley of Hinoam here, where we get Gehenna, or they were left to rot, and the birds and stuff come and peck them and eat them up clean. But the Jews want these bodies off the cross. They come and they're showing Jesus, giving him honors, an honorable burial here. And they are openly identifying themselves with Jesus. They would not have done that uh, under other circumstances. Being somebody being a true criminal, they're saying, we, we believe in him, we respect him, and we are honoring him. And so now their discipleship is out in the open. But as with many others, um, they see what happened unfolded with Jesus. You know, the other accounts talk about even the Roman soldier standing there. When he died and all those things unfolded, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. So it had an impact on people, and they give him that honorable burial. All right, any other thoughts before we close out? All right, thank you all, and uh, Lord willing, John 20 with Mike next week.